ബിസ്മില്ലാഹിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനിർമാനി
for me, I've been reading this for the last two weeks, or this week specifically. I've been with this book for my lunch and my dinner. It is always with me. Because I have to prepare and come and share with you. If I got tired and said, we can just tweet, you know, the seerah and khalas. Then nobody is going to know the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And maybe I should encourage you, before you come tomorrow, you go back to the recordings and listen to the first lecture we did here, around two years ago, on why it is so important for the Muslim to learn the seerah. Every now and then we need the encouragement. So be patient, stay patient, be strong, stay strong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His reward for those who learn the religion is great. And that is why many of the scholars of Islam, they say what? There's nothing after the fara'id, after the obligatory matters, which is which has more reward than seeking knowledge of Islam. Not the Sunnah prayers, not the Sunnah fast, nothing. Why? Because seeking knowledge is a must. And how are you going to fast and pray and give zakah or whatever without seeking knowledge? I told you this before, maybe I did or maybe I did not. But it's a shame. When someone asks you a question about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his life, and you don't know the answer. I, I'm talking about myself right now. If someone was to ask you, a Muslim, what happened in the sixth year of the Hijrah after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina? Do you know anything which happened then? If you as a Muslim, I looked at myself and I said, if you as a Muslim cannot answer that question, then Aiba alayka, and that's a shame on you. But yet we know the history of our countries when this was fought, when independence was got, who was the first prime minister, and then who killed him, and then who set him up, and when did the uh, your favorite football player, when was he born, and which school did he go to, and all that <clears throat> information which has no benefit or purpose in your life. So I found it to be shameful. I don't know about you. If someone was to ask me about the life of my Prophet and I'd not know the details of it. So be patient. The reward is in the journey. It's not in the destination. The reward is in the journey. You have to enjoy the journey. It's not about the destination. And we said that before. If it was only a matter of reading the book and then said, yes, we finished the book, we could have done that in two days. So, the battle of Al-Ahzab. Al-Ahzab must be a word which rings a bell, is very common to you. And why is that? Because Al-Ahzab, there's a surah of the Quran, there's a whole chapter of the Quran called Surah Al-Ahzab which is chapter number 33 of the Qur'an. And that surah of the Qur'an is talking about the event which we are going to be talking about today. And we mentioned this before, we said what? The first source of the seerah is the Qur'an. The first source of the seerah is the Qur'an. Surah Al-Ahzab discusses what we are going to discuss today with more details. As you know, the sunnah explains the Qur'an. Ahzab, Jam'u Hizb, is the plural of the word Hizb in Arabic, it's a party. Okay? Today you have two main parties in Canada, the Liberals and the Conservatives. Okay? That is a Hizb party, or a group. Then we have the Green Party. So this is the plural of Group, which means groups. In the Quran, most of the translators use the old word for Surah Al Ahzab. They said the chapter of the Confederates. The chapter of the Confederates. Why? And why was this battle called the Battle of Ahzab? 
And it's because the confederates of different groups, they came together to fight the Muslims, which had never happened before for those of you who have been learning the seerah with us together. This is right after Uhud, where the Muslims were hit with a severe blow, and then Muraysiyah, and then the Muslims regained some of the authority. Now comes the Battle of Al-Ahzab. How did it come about? He says here, and this is the fifth year in Shawwal, the month of Shawwal, of the fifth year. The reason of it is that the Jews of Banu Nadir, which we have known before, those who broke the treaty of the Prophet and they were fought and then most of them fled to Khaybar. The Jews of Banu Nadir from the leaders of Salam ibn Mishkam, Salam ibn Abi Huqayq and Huyay ibn Akhtab. We all know by now Huyay ibn Akhtab whose daughter is now married to the Prophet وسلم, Safiyyat ibn Huyay and then Kinan ibn Rabi'ah and others. They left from Khaybar because of the hasad, the envy, and the enmity they had against the Prophet ﷺ just after they were defeated. And after the fact that the Quraysh could not defeat the Muslims in Uhud, they left and they went to Mecca, this delegation of the Jews of Banu, of Banu Nadir, and they incited them to fight the Muslims again. And they gave them the promise, the promise that we are going to stand with you this time. We are going to fight with you. Because what happened to you has happened to us also. And that we should gather all of the enemies of Islam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we should go this time into Medina and finish them off. The men and then take their women and their children as slaves. The Quraysh seeing that this is a great source of support, they accepted that. Because they knew by themselves they could never defeat the Muslims. As we saw in Uhud, there were 3,000 fighting an army of 700 men, yet they could not defeat them. So now if the Jews are with us, and the other Arabs, then we have a huge chance of decimating, exterminating, the Muslims. And in fact, we're going to go not just fight them, we're going to go and invade their homes in Medina. The Quraysh, they accepted that and then they asked the Jews, they said, Ya Ma'ashar Yahud, O Jews, tell us something. You are Ahlul Kitab. You were given the book before. And you have seen the difference between us and Muhammad. Do you think his religion or our religion is better? And the Jews, they said, of course, your religion is better. And you are closer to the haqq, to the truth. And that is the reason Allah revealed the verse in Surah An-Nisa. When Allah says, Alam tara Have you not seen those who have been given a portion of the book? Yu'minuna bil jibti wa ta'ghut. They believe in magic and the false gods. And they say to those of disbelief, meaning the Quraysh of Makkah, You are more guided than those who are Muslims. Those people who do that, they are the ones whom Allah has cast. And the one who Allah casts, فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُ نَصِيرًا you shall never find for him an aid or a helper. Al-Imam Ibn Kathir in his tafsir he says, this is a curse upon them and an information that they will never have any help or any support. Not in this world, neither in the hereafter. Be because they went about to aid the mushrikun, the polytheists, and they said what they said, even though they knew the truth, that the Muslims are the ones who are more guided than the idol worshippers. And that is why this battle which they were planning, Allah, could, Allah did not give them any victory or any help. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ahzab, 
ورد الله الذين كفروا بغيظهم لم ينالوا خيرا and allah returned back and repulsed those who were disbelievers because of the enmity and jealousy they had and the envy they did not even get anything وقف الله المؤمنين القتال الله صفاص the believers that did not have to fight وكان الله قويا عزيزا and allah is always and ever the most mighty the most strong so when the quraysh had this answer from the jews they got excited if the jews are with us and the jews they recognize that we are more guided than muhammad and his followers they got excited and they started gathering their army and remember this was supposed to be the army of all armies the mad of all armies so they can go to madina and kill all the men and take the women and the children as slaves so they started to send messages to all their allies so quraish they went out with the ahabish ahabish <coughs> is a word used for the arab bedouins who live near makkah who always supported the quraish against the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the muslims they are called ahabish we mentioned this one before and they gathered <coughs> they gathered together an army of 4000 men I remember last year in uhud they came with 3000 men now them by themselves there were 4000 men and they gave the flag in darul nadwa that parliament of theirs I mentioned before to of course the same family which we had mentioned in the battle of uhud who were who 10 or 11 of them were killed Uthman ibn Talha ibn Abi Talha because that tribe it was their job to carry the flag during the battles and they had 300 horsemen and they had 1500 camels with them and of course their leader was Abu Sufyan ibn Harb and when they were leaving Banu Sulaim the tribe of Sulaim met with them with 700 men being led by Sufyan ibn Abd al-Shams and then Banu Asad came out led by Tulayha ibn Khuwailid who we're going to mention after Tulayha ibn Khuwailid is a man who later on he'll claim that he's a prophet also and then the tribes of Ghatfan the tribes of Ghatfan they came with Banu Fazara 1000 men under the leadership of Uyayn ibn Hisn and Banu Murra they had 400 men under Al-Harith ibn Auf and Banu Ashja' and there were 400 men under Mis'ar ibn Zuhayla and other people and they turned out to be an army of 10000 men 10000 men now i don't know if you know you don't know but now you have to know an army of 10000 men is a huge army there is a very huge army especially during those times that's an unprecedented army 10000 men that's a lot of men and imagine in uhud which was the last major battle the muslims fought how many were they how many fought 700 so you can imagine the they call in english the odds against the muslims they literally had 700 men now there's an army of 10000 men coming and they're not just coming to fight them somewhere else no they're coming to attack their houses with their women and their children tayyib and of course the tribes of the jews of banu nadir are going to support them also that was the whole plan that was the whole plan that is why allah called them the ahzab the confederates that is why this called the battle of the ahzab because there's these different groups they all came together and they were all under the command of abu sufyan and some of you i see there's new faces we are learning the sira some of the names we mentioned later on they're going to become some of the best muslims but this is the time when they were not muslims yet like abu sufyan radiyallahu anhu he was not a muslim yet in fact he was the leader of kufr do you see that you see how allah guides someone 
he was the leader of kufr fighting the muslims and going to kill the prophet and in a few years allah will make his heart change into a muslim's heart so an army of 10000 men went out before they left the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam news reached to him about this plan and this plot from a man from banu khuza'a and he told them that uh, Quraysh and all of his allies, including the Jews of Banu Nadir, they're gathering together an unprecedented army to come and fight you in Medina. When the Prophet ﷺ heard this, and it was a time where it was winter in Medina. The winter months are between December, January, February. That's when it gets most cold. <clears throat> and it was a time when the Muslims were not doing very well financially. They were poor. We have seen until now the Muslims were very poor in fact. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he had this, obviously he called the meeting right away because this is something scary. And as was his custom, Shawarahum fil Amri. He consulted his companions. What should we do? It is a matter which we talked for we talked about a few times how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do mushawara, consult his companions. And this is when the man we mentioned very earlier on, and we have not mentioned him since. This is when his mention stands out, and that is who? Who knows? Who's the person who stood out at this moment? Salman al-Faris, Salman al-Faris. We mentioned him, like I said, almost two years ago. We mentioned his story when the Prophet wasallam came to Medina. How he recognized that this is the Prophet. And how his long journey of coming to Islam. We mentioned that. But he was still a slave to one of the Jews of Medina until he became free. He was a Muslim. But we didn't mention him in Badr, neither Uhud, nor any of the other events. Now he's going to become prominent. So the Prophet ﷺ consulted his companions. There's an army of 10,000 men coming. What should we do? And Salman said, Ya Rasulullah, O Muslim of Allah, back where I'm from, back where I'm from, which is, Bilad Faris, what we call today Pajia. When an enemy would come to attack us in our land, Khandaqna, we will build a Khandaq, a trench. We will build a trench, and in that way the enemy cannot reach us. And this was something the Arabs never heard of and never knew of before. Now I know some of you Arabs are going to look at me like, oh, what is the Sheikh saying? We don't know how to fight. I didn't say that. I'm just teaching you the seerah. You didn't know this back then. You know why they didn't know this? We mentioned this point before. Because the Arabs never fought anyone from outside. They just used to fight each other. Why they never fought someone from outside? The two superpowers of the time, Persia and Rome, or the Byzantines as they're called sometimes. Because neither of them wanted anything to do with the Arabs. They had nothing. For them, these Arabs were nobodies. And there's nothing there before the discovery of oil. Now the Arabs are everything because there's oil. Everybody wants to invade your countries now. Before then, there was nothing. Nobody even cared about the Arabs. So Salmani said, when people who come to attack us, we will build a trench. If you build a trench, in fact... Trench warfare is something used until today in times of jets and technology and whatnot. You know what a trench is? It's a ditch. So we dig from here to there and we make it deep. No car can drive through that hole. No, they didn't even have cars or tanks. They had what? Horses and camels. No, no horse or camel can do that. And the Prophet ﷺ really liked the idea and they all accepted the idea. But now you're going to ask yourself, how, how are you going to dig a trench around a whole city? It was easy for them because Medina 
strategically. We mentioned this in the Battle of Uhud also, if you remember. In the east and the west of Medina, is what we call the Harra. It's just rocks. It's very rocky. Nobody can travel through that, let alone an army of 10,000 men. No one could attack them from the east or the west. It's just rocks we call today hills or small mountains. And to the back of them were the houses and the farms. And mostly, there were the many houses of Banu Quraiza. Now This is very key. Banu Quraiza was the only remaining Jewish tribe in Medina. After Qainuqa, they betrayed the Muslims that were kicked out. And Nadir, they betrayed the Muslims that were kicked out. The only remaining tribe was Banu Quraiza. And those were their houses. But the Muslims had nothing to fear because they were allies. They had signed a peace treaty, if you remember, we mentioned that. So the Muslims were safe from three directions. So the only direction they had to build the trench was the only way the enemy could attack them. So they started digging the trench. Taim, they started digging the trench. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he divided the groups of men. And remember the Muslims are poor. And it is a time of hardship. They were hungry. And it was very cold. Those of you who have gone to Medina. There are some days in Medina. Especially in the morning. Fajr. You need a jacket. Just like in Ottawa. Not a heavy Canada goose jacket. But you need a jacket. It gets cold. Even though it was very tough. The enemy who was going to come to them was really scared. They were scared for themselves, for their children, for their women, for Islam. Imagine and remember, this was the main group of Muslims in the world at that time. And the Prophet ﷺ himself, he was digging with the other Sahaba. He was digging with the other Sahaba as was narrated by Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu anhu said or oh, Anas ibn Malik he said I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he came and he saw the Sahaba, the Muhajirun and the Ansar digging now remember it's a trench the purpose of the trench is what? so the enemy cannot cross so it has to be wide enough and it has to be deep enough right? It has to be wide enough that even a fast horse cannot jump over and has to be deep enough that he can't just go inside and come out. So you can imagine the amount of work which had to be done. He says the Prophet Sallallahu came and saw them in the cold day when they were digging the trench and they never had slaves. فَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُمْ عَبِيدٌ they didn't have slaves to do that work for them. So they were doing it themselves. When the Prophet ﷺ saw the tiredness and the hunger which had struck them. قال, he said, Allahumma, inna al-aisha aishu al-asira. Faghfir lil-ansar wal-muhajira. Oh Allah, the true life is the life of the hereafter. So forgive the muhajir and the ansar. And when they heard the Prophet Sallallahu making dua for them, they responded to him saying the line of poetry, نَحْنُ الَّذِينَ بَايَعُوا مُحَمَّدًا We are the ones who gave our pledge of allegiance to Muhammad. عَلَى الْجِهَادِ مَا بَقِينَ أَبَدًا That we are going to fight with him until the last moments of our life. And in the hadith of Barab ibn Azib he said, when the day of Ahzab, the Prophet Sallallahu he was there digging with us just like anyone else. And I saw how his chest was filled with dust. And I heard him saying these lines of poetry, the poetry of Abdullah ibn Rawaha, which you mentioned before. We said the main poets of the Prophet ﷺ were Hassan ibn Thabit and Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Prophet ﷺ was digging himself 
filled with sand and he was saying Allahumma lawla anta mahtadayna wa la tasaddaqna wa la sallayna fa anzilan sakinatan alayna wa thabbit al aqdama in laqayna inna al ula qad baghaw alayna wa in aradu fitnatan abayna 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 he said what means Allahumma lawla anta mahtadayna oh Allah if it was not for you never be guided وَلَا تُصَدَّقْنَا وَلَا سَلَّيْنَ We'll never have given charity nor prayed. فَأَنزِلَ سَكِينَةً عَلَيْنَا So bring tranquility and calmness to our hearts. وَثَبِّتِ الْأَقْدَامَ إِلَّا قَيْنَا And make our feet firm when we meet the enemy. If we meet the enemy. إِنَّ الْأُولَى قَدْ بَغَوْ عَلَيْنَا These are the enemies that have transgressed on us. وَإِنْ أَرَادُ فِتْنَةً أَبَيْنَا And if they want fitna, meaning for us to leave Islam, we refuse that. Now you can imagine how powerful these words were. Let alone how powerful this scenario was. That the Muslims, they see their own prophet digging just like they are digging. Taking out the sand just like they are taking out the sand. Suffering just like they are suffering. And that is the true picture of how great, and that is what we say, the greatest leader of humanity, of humanity, was the Prophet ﷺ. He was not that leader who gave a command and he sat in his high tent and high chair. No. He was with them in the field, in the trench, with his bare hands, getting dirty when they were getting dirty. Hungry when they were hungry. So you can imagine how this gave them what we call what? Soul food. They didn't have food for the belly, but this gave them the food of their iman and the motivation to continue doing what they were doing. Because they had a great leader. Because they had a great leader. Now, what was the food they had? Anas al-Malik radiallahu anhu, he describes again. He said the only food they had for those days, and by the way, the digging of the trench took them around a month, a whole month. You can imagine, a whole month, around 24 days to 30 days. Like we said, it has to be wide enough and deep enough for the enemy not to cross. And you have to do it the length of Medina. It's not digging a hole from here to there. In those conditions. He said they used to be brought wheat or barley and they would make a porridge of it and that wheat was almost going bad and they had to drink that and it smelled so bad. But that was the only food available. That was the only food available. I don't want this to seem bad or to sound bad. But me and you, just because you got in your car, which is heat, and you came and pray Isha, you think you did Islam a great service. You did not. You did yourself a service. You have to pray Isha, alhamdulillah. We want to learn the seerah, and that is why the seerah is so important for a Muslim. It reminds you of the great sacrifice they put in. Which should do what? It should lead us to put more sacrifice for our religion. Jabir ibn Abdullah, he says in his version of the story, I was sitting there watching the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he had tied a stone on his belly. When they used to be hungry, they would take a stone and tie it to the belly. There's different reasons for that. Number one, you know when you're hungry, your stomach becomes hot. The stone provides some coolness. Also, it stops it from groaning, making those noises. And it supports you to do whatever work you have to do. They had tied stones, but the Prophet ﷺ tied two, two stones on his belly. 
because of how hungry he was. He said, Jabir, so that affected me a lot. So I left and I went home and I asked my woman, my wife, what do you have? Because I saw the Prophet ﷺ so hungry, it affected me a lot. And she said, we have a little bit of wheat or barley and we have this um, sheep of ours or goat, it was a sheep. So she said, we are going to slaughter this sheep and you're going to make some bread and we invite the Prophet ﷺ and two or three men. That's all what is enough for. So he slaughtered the sheep and as his wife was preparing, he left Jabir and she said to him, call the Prophet ﷺ and two or three people, you see whatever food we have, لا تفضحنا. don't humiliate us. Don't humiliate us. We're going to talk about Jabir and his wife soon, inshallah. So Jabir went back when the Prophet ﷺ is digging and he went and he went to tell him as a secret. Said, Ya Rasulullah, I prepared something at home for you. Maybe bring one or two people. Of course, Abu Bakr or Umar, you know. When he said that, the Prophet said, Ayyuhal Qawm, O people, Jagar has prepared food for us. And he said, There were more than 1,000 men. There were more than 1,000 men. He says, Jabir, when I heard that, I ran home right away. I ran home right away when my wife saw me. She said, what, are you, what did you do? And she say, and he said, I told him to come, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he called everyone. And she started saying to him, what, what your wife would say to you today. You know, I don't have to say that. <laughs> and then she said, did you call them or he called them though? And he said, no, I told him and he called them. She said, then don't worry. Allah. She said, what? Then don't worry, it's not your responsibility. When the Prophet sallallahu came with everyone following, you can imagine this man who've been at work, labor work, what you call construction work, for days, no food. When he came, he told Jabir and his wife, do not put the bread into the furla, oven, before I come, before I get there. And do not take out the meat from the pot. Jabir said, the Prophet sallallahu came, and he said, Bismillah, and he spat in the, in the ajin, what do you call it, the dough for the bread, and he spat in the pot. And then he told Jabir, let them enter group by group. And he would give the dough to the one, the woman who was making the bread, and whenever it came out, it would be served to the people. And he would say, he would serve uh, the, the meat. Jabir said, Wakanu Alf, and there were 1,000 men. All of them ate until they were full. And then the, everything remained as it was. Everything remained as it was. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Jabir, now it is my turn, me and you. Because that is the Sunnah. You know the Sunnah? Saqi al-Qawm, akhiruhum shurban. When you are the host, you eat last. When you host people, you, you eat last. That is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. They went back to digging. They were digging the trench, fearing this enemy which was coming. And there's a few miracles which also happened there. One of them is when they were digging and they hit this huge rock which no one could crush. Again, all they had was shovels and what you call them? A pickaxe. That's all they had. Again, remember the Muslims were poor. No one could crack this rock. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and he took the, the pickaxe or the shovel 
And he said, Bismillah, as in the hadith of Jabir. He said, Bismillah. And also the hadith of al Barab bin Azib. And in one narration, he says, He said, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا لَا مُبَدِّلًا لِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ The verse is in Surah Al-An'am. وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ And the word of your Lord has been perfected. Sidqan in truth or adlan in justice. Islam is the truth and it is justice. You have to believe that. لا مبدل لكلماته No one can change Allah's word. وهو السميع العليم And is the most hearing, the most seeing. And then he hit the rock. And the thought of it burst. And there was a white light which came from it. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Allahu Akbar. He said, Allahu Akbar. أُعْتِيتُ مَفَاتِحَ الشَّامِ I've been given the keys to Asham. The lands which are today Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon. I've been given the keys to Sham. Wallahi inni la ubsiru qusurah al humr al anam in makani hada. I can see it's red castles right now from here. Now remember Sham during those days. All of it, including Europe, was under the Crusaders, uh, not the Crusaders, the, the Christians, the Byzantines, the Romans. They were the one superpower of the world. And then the Prophet ﷺ hit the rock again saying, Bismillah, wa tammat kalimatu rabbika sidqan wa adla, la mubaddila li kalimatihi wa huwa sami'u al-alim. The Lord of the word of your Lord has been perfected in truth and justice. Nobody can change it. And is the oft hearing, the oft seeing. And the light came from it and he said, Allahu Akbar, Uutitu Mafati Hafaris. I've been given the keys to Pajia. Wallahi inni la ubsiru qasr al madain al abyad al an. I can see its great white palace right now. Pajia was all the way from Iran, Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Bahrain in fact. Bahrain as you know today was under the Persians also. That was the other superpower of the world that time. The Persians and the Romans. And they had that great white castle or palace their leader used to stay in. And then the Prophet wasallam hit that rock again saying, Bismillah wa tammat kalimatu rabbika sidqan wa adra. And he said, Allahu Akbar, u'titu mafatiha Yemen. I've been given the keys to Yemen. The great land of Yemen, which was, by the way, at this time we're talking about under the Persians, if you remember. The Persians defeated the Romans and they removed the Romans and they took over. Yemen was under the Persians also. Wa inni, wallahi inni la ubsiru babu sana'a. I can see the door of Sana'a right now. When he said this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, رفعت معنويتهم. Their morale became so high. This was news the Arabs could never dream of. Like we say. They were a tiny speck, a tiny dot. They were not in the equation, as we say. They were not considered in the world at that time. Now their prophet tells them, the news has come, good news. You are going to own both Sham and Persia and Yemen. So the Muslims become very happy. While well, the Munafiqun, the hypocrites, they became very sad. And they started talking to each other. Remember, never forget the hypocrites. Remember what they just did. What they just did, they created that great fitna in Medina for a whole month. When they accused and slandered Aisha radiallahu anha. That just ended right now. This is the next event. And they started talking. And they said, look what Muhammad is promising you. You're going to own the treasures of Persia and Rome. And today you're filled with hunger. You can't even go and urinate. Because you're fearing there's an army going to come. There was the dawr, the role of the hypocrites as always. The Muslims, they finished digging the trench, like we said, around a month. 
hard work. Immediately they finished, subhanallah, that is when the army of the Ahzab, the confederates, they almost reached Medina. Around this time, there's one event which happens, one event we have to mention. Al-Harith ibn Ziyad al-Sa'idi, radiyallahu anhu. Al-Harith ibn Ziyad al-Sa'idi. I mentioned this before, guys. Some of the names I mentioned, they may not be familiar to you. I don't expect you to memorize them right away. But that is why we have recordings. That is why we say we're studying the seerah. You go back home, you listen to the recordings, you take your notes. You become an expert in the seerah. You know who did what and when did he do what. And I can tell you this, very sadly, very sad. There's barely a handful of them, experts of the seerah. Not in the Arab world scholars, not in the English world Islamic scholars. A handful of them. Am I right or wrong? Al-Harith, Al-Sa'idi, he came with his nephew to give the Prophet wasallam the bay'ah of doing hijrah. But the Prophet ﷺ refused to give him the pledge. Why? Because it's from the Ansar, the people of Medina. He said, I came to the Prophet ﷺ with my nephew. And he wanted to give the Prophet ﷺ the pledge of allegiance to do hijrah, to migrate. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, who's this one? And he said, it's my nephew. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, La I'll never give you the pledge. The people, they migrate to you, Ansar, people of Medina. You do not migrate to anyone. That was the hijrah then. The Muslims, anyone who had the ability, we mentioned this before, he had to move from whatever city he was living in to go to Medina. That is why Medina is Darul Hijrah. People migrate to you. You don't migrate to people. Why? Who told you? Nobody can leave Medina like that. The Prophet says, taking an oath, I swear by the one in whose soul is my hand, in whose hand is my soul. Allah No one loves the Ansar until the day he dies and he meets Allah. Except that Allah will love him. And nobody dislikes and hates the Ansar. And he dies on that head. Except that Allah will meet him when Allah hates him. And we had a whole lecture. We discussed the greatness and the excellence of the Ansar in Islam. You can go back to the recordings for that. These are the people who just loving them. Might be your and my ticket to Jannah. And that is why we have to study them, to study their lives. How can you love people you don't know? Right or wrong? This is when the army of the Mushrikun, they reached Medina. When they reached Medina, the Quraysh, like we said, and the Ahabish, there were 4,000 men. They camped in the high parts of Medina, Ali. Okay, and in the lower parts of Medina came Ghatafan and the other people from Najd, 6,000 men close to Jabal Uhud. And that is when Allah says, now in Surah Al Ahzab, إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ When they came to you from the higher parts of Medina, and from the lower parts of Medina. In Surah Al-Ahzab again. Okay? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tried to gather as many men as he could. And he managed to gather uh, 3,000 men. Who were going to defend the trench. And he commanded that the children, the babies, the women. To be taken into the high houses. They didn't have high rises. The best I think they had was one story or two story buildings. 
so the women and the children are to be protected up there. And he put in charge of Medina, meaning in the city, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, who we mentioned before, the blind man, to show you that in Islam, being handicapped does not mean you're less or you're lower than anyone. doesn't mean that. In Islam, your merit is your iman and your actions, your knowledge of Islam. He gave the banner, the flag of the Muhajirun to Zayd ibn Haritha. And he gave the flag of the Ansar to Sa'd ibn Ubadah radiallahu anhu. And he told them, if by any chance the enemy was to attack us at night, then the words you're going to say to warn every Muslim is Hamim la yunsarun. It's like a code word to tell us we are under attack. Hamim la yunsarun. This is in Sunan at They built a tent for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so he can overlook the wall and he can direct them. And men from the Ansar used to guard the tent from them, Abbad ibn Bishr, radiallahu anhu. When the Ahzab they reached. And the Muslims saw this great army. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ahzab, وَلَمَّا رَأَى الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْزَابَ قَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعْدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا تَسْلِيمًا When the believers saw the Ahzab, the confederates had arrived, they said, this is what Allah and His Messenger promised us, and Allah and His Messenger have said the truth, and that only increased them in Iman and submission. Allah. Imagine a people, their Iman is so strong, when they see an army, an enemy coming to fight them, it only increases them in Iman. But when the Mushrikun arrived, though, they were surprised, they were startled, they were puzzled in fact, flabbergasted. They saw a trench, a ditch, they never saw a trench in their lives before. And they said, This is a war strategy the Arabs never knew before. They expected an easy fight. 10,000 men, they were just going to come and roll in and crush the Arabs and the Muslims of Medina. No. They faced a trench they could not go past. And there was no way to attack the Muslims. They said, this is a strategy the Arabs never knew before. Which of course, a strategy brought by who? A non-Arab. To show you again. You don't have to be an Arab to be a good Muslim. Some of you think like that. You know, I'm Somali. You know, I can't be the Imam of the Mosque. Who told you that? Who told you that? Oh, I'm, I'm African. No. Al-Islam came and removed those classes, that racism. Your grade is by your Iman, your good action, and your knowledge of the deen. They found a trench. They never knew. They were confused. Like I said, flabbergasted. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. So they just set camp. They just set camp, of course, beyond the trench. And all they could do, they started throwing arrows at the Muslims. And the Muslims responded with arrows. But there was no fighting. It can never be fighting. Now while this was happening, while this was happening, something else started to happen. Now I told you, remember, to the east of Medina was what? The Harra, the rocks. To the west of Medina, rocks. Behind them were the houses and the farms. And mostly the houses of who? Banu Quraidah. Very good. The last Jewish tribe. When Abu Sufyan, the leader of the Ahzab, came and saw the trench, there was no way for, 
to go past it. He plotted and he said, you know what? Maybe we should send an offer to Banu Huraydah so they can betray the Muslims. So they can betray the Muslims. Are they going to betray them or not? That is what we'll discuss tomorrow, inshaAllah. Okay? Tomorrow we start at 5 p.m. Tomorrow we start at 5 p.m. It will be in the hall though, not here. But to be in the in the hall, community hall, the basement. So I don't want to keep you out for long. I know people of Ottawa by now you're all in bed. You know. <laughs> don't mind Muhammad. Muhammad is my student, this is how he laughs. So we laugh at his laugh. <laughs> we'll continue tomorrow, inshallah guys. Any questions you have? They are going to be answered on Sunday after Isha with myself and Sheikh Ismail during his halaq. That is the time we leave all the questions for. Tomorrow is 5 p.m. inshallah at the basement. Taib subhanakallahumma bihamdik shalallahu ilayhi 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 ilayhi